Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Fat Rat webinar. My name is Sandy Pachalia, and I'm from Taconic. I'm the product manager for the Fat Rat, and I would like to introduce Dr. Mull, who is our speaker today. Dr. Mull received his PhD from the University of in 2010 for the characterization of different novel genetic rat models related to the regulation of energy homeostasis. While at the Hubrich Institute, which is connected to the University of Utrecht, Dr. Moll published on the importance of the melanin concentrating hormone precursor, PMCH, for energy homeostasis during early development and on the basic characterization of the melanocortin 4 receptor knockout rat. Since February 2011, Dr. Moll has been a postdoc fellow at the lab of Professor Randy Seeley at the University of Cincinnati, where he uses genetic rat and murine models to study different aspects of energy homeostasis. At the University of Cincinnati, Dr. Moll's research includes, but is not limited to, further characterization of the melanocortin 4 receptor knockout rat. His interests include bariatric surgery, gut-derived signals, regulating food intake, the GLP-1 system, food choice, and obesity-related inflammation. And Dr. Moll, I now hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunny. Um, so welcome everybody um, to today uh, to comic webinar about uh, melanocortin uh, receptor for red model. Um, as Sandy mentioned, my name is Joram uh, Mill. Um, I uh, I was a, a PhD student in uh, the lab of uh, Edwin Kuppe at the Uber Institute in the Netherlands, um, and that's where we uh, um, developed uh, the technique of ENU mutagenesis, um, which we used to uh, create. Uh, um, uh, red knockout models, and uh, especially the model that we'll talk about today. And um, about a year ago, I moved to uh, to Cincinnati uh, to Randy Seeley's lab, um, and I uh, took uh, the red model along. And um, we're now doing some several studies um, using this red model, and one of them is is, uh, is using uh, it in combination with bariatric surgery. And I will show you some data um, later on today um, regarding that. So how will the, the, the webinar today look like? Um, um, briefly, I'll give an introduction uh, regarding uh, ENU mutagenesis. Um, then I'll give a slight introduction about the, the current melanocortin 4 mouse models that are out there. Um, I'll show you the data that we had, uh, that we uh, generated regarding the basal characterization of the red model. Um, then I'll show you data regarding the red model and uh, a bariatric surgery study. And then I'll be happy to uh, to answer any questions. Um, so please feel free to uh, to note any questions you have, uh, so I can answer them at the end. So in about uh, or around the 1980s, um, embryonic stem cells uh, um, were were found or used in in mice models um, um, to do gene modification, and um, a Nobel Prize was awarded for this in 2007. Um, unfortunately. Um, no embryonic stem cells were available in rats. Um, however, uh, recent scientific progress um, has changed that. So, in 2008, um, a group from uh, the UK has published that uh, embryonic stem cells were isolated in rats, and um, this might um, start a, a genetic comeback for rats. Another uh, publication in 2009 showed that you could use uh, knockout rats uh, or, or create knockout rats using zinc finger uh, nucleases. Um, however, in the, the early 2000s, um, those two techniques were not available. And um, it is that my, my former uh, PI, Edwin Kuppa, came up with an, with an idea of using EMU mutagenesis, uh, or target-selected mutagenesis. This, te uh, this technique has been around and used in, in different organisms, uh, such as Drosophila, uh, C. elegans, and, and zebrafish. And it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. So what we do is, uh, if we look here at um, um, uh, number one, we inject ENU, uh, which is an ethyl and nitrosuria, into, uh, into mill rats, you know, IP injection. And uh, normally we, we, we did this for, uh, for two or three times, and we waited a week between each injection. 
and then we wait a full round of uh, uh, spermatogenesis, and so uh, the point mutation uh, could be incorporated into the sperm. And um, these male rats were bred with wild-type females to generate a, uh, a cohort of F1 uh, animals. And we isolated the DNA from these F1 animals and using either tilling or a sequencing uh, uh, strategy, um, we would look for mutations induced in genes of interest. And if we uh, found a gene of interest, uh, we could outcross the animal, breed it to Homo sacosti, and study it. Um, if you look at my former uh, um, uh, PI, Edmund Cup at PubMed, you can, you can see a number uh, of publications uh, describing this technique in detail. Um, so there's, a, there's an advantage uh, to this, to using in human genesis, and that is that you can generate allelic series to, to mimic human biology. Um, there's also, however, a, a disadvantage, and that is that you, uh, you create a, a number of background mutations also in genes that you're not interested in. And another disadvantage is that it's, it's, it's non-target uh, mutagenesis. So um, you cannot target a gene. You have to be lucky that, 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 you, in, that, that you induce a mutation um, into your gene of interest, and preferably that you uh, create a knockout or a functional knockout. Um, other limitations are that, um, for example, the amount of, uh, of animals that you can hold in your uh, animal facility um, is limited, of course. Uh, however, recent progress has uh, uh, developed uh, sperm libraries, so you don't need to keep live animals around anymore. And another uh, recent advantage is that um, next generation sequencers are available to, to sequence the genome of a rat uh, pretty quickly. Um, so we can find uh, more and more mutations. And this, uh, uh, we don't miss any mutations and we create more and more red models. So one of the, the red models that we uh, um, created um, using this uh, technique, using in mutagenesis, is the, the melanin cordon receptor for mutant red, um, which I will talk about today. Um, because most of you are familiar with melanin cordon 4, uh, however, I'll give a, a very slight introduction. Um, it's, a, it's a family of five uh, uh, receptors, melancholin receptors one till five. Um, melancholin three and four are uh, the, the, the important receptors uh, central in the brain. Um, melancholin three also has a role in, uh, in energy balance, uh, although not as, uh, as important as melancholin receptor four. Um, MC4R is, is, is important for short and long-term regulation of energy homeostasis. Um, its agonist is alpha MSH, which is uh, produced uh, from, from POMC. And its uh, inverse agonist or antagonist are AGUI and ADRP. And already 15 years ago, it was shown uh, in the mouse that um, if we disrupt melancholin 4, this results in, uh, in obesity. And it also has been shown that um, haploinsufficiency, um, so heterozygosity of melancholin receptor 4 is the most common genetic cause of, uh, of human obesity. Um, and this is actually reviewed recently. Um, here you can see an overview of the of a rodent brain. And in yellow um, is shown a couple of uh, um, um, example brain regions uh, or representative for expression of melanin cordon for uh, nuclei. So these include uh, the PVN, for example. So as I mentioned before, there, there are uh, melanin cordon 4 mouse models available. Um, in, in 1997, um, Millennium Pharmaceuticals published a paper in Cell where they disrupted melanocortin 4, and this uh, resulted in obesity in, in, in the mouse. And a couple of years ago, seven years ago, um, the group of uh, Joel Elmquist here in, in the U.S. Um, published another Cell paper where they, uh, they created and, and uh, um, uh, published a different model, which is the reactivatable LOX-TB melanocortin 4 knockout model. So this one is a, a null for melanocortin 4, but you can reactivate it uh, using specific three models. So these two mouse models uh, have been very, very powerful and important for uh, um, analyzing or studying the, the function of melanocortin 4 in, uh, in energy, in regulating energy balance. And um, using a plethora of genetic models, such as different Cree models, um, help to dissect uh, the functional pathway. Um, where melanocortin 4 is involved. Another uh, strength or, or advantage of the mouse is that it's small and relatively cheap. Um, 
the strength of the, using a rat model would be that, um, for example, the most extensively studied organism to model human physiology, toxicology, neurobiology, et cetera. Um, and this has um, resulted in an immense database of rat data. And furthermore, um, the rat is relatively large, so uh, it enables more complex surgeries compared to the mouse. And it's also relatively smart, so uh, um, it might enable uh, um, complex behavioral studies. So we thought that, that uh, the man corner for uh, mutant rat, and I have to clearly say that we never think that it's, it's uh, the rat model can replace any mouse model. I think it's a, it's a good addition to the already existing uh, mouse models to study uh, the function of manacordin 4. Um, however, before we know um, if, if the, the red model is a, is a valuable addition to, to all the, the different models out there, um, we had to perform a basal characterization first. And this was done at the, the Ubrecht Institute uh, in the Netherlands. So in this slide, you can see a um, overview of all the, the manacordin 4 mutations uh, I guess almost all of them reported to date. Um, you can see the, the seven transmembranes. Um, so, metacornal force is seven transmembrane G, G PCR, G protein coupled receptor. You can see the extracellular domain and the intracellular domain. And using um, ENU mutagenesis, we induced a point mutation in the lysine uh, located at position 314. Um, indicated here. And this um, uh, mutation induced a, a premature stop codon. So this would um, result in a amino acid uh, truncation uh, at the C terminus. And if you compare this truncation to the rest of the, the protein, um, it doesn't look like much. You only lose a couple, a couple of amino acids. However, um, if you look here, you can see there's two isoleucines and two uh, cysteine uh, uh, residues. And those residues are, are very important for a GPCR, or in this case, monochrome 4, to localize to the cell membrane and to, uh, um, and to, to be presented at the cell membrane and for its stability. So this in situ prediction um, told us that, that this mutation very probably would result in a uh, loss of function. However, we had to show, of course, that this really happened. And the first thing we did is we went uh, and looked at the, the mutation in vitro. So what we did is we took um, the construct. Um, so either we took the wild type construct from Anacorn 4, we took the, our mutated construct, or we used an MT factor. And we um, um, expressed these constructs in HeLa cells. Um, and these are in tech cells shown in, uh, in, in B. And um, we stained for DAPI, uh, which is the nucleus staining. And um, all constructs were also uh, fused to a, a hemagglutinin tag, HA tag. And we used this uh, HA tag to uh, visualize the receptor. So what you can see here with the wildcard construct that we, if we use the we stain for NTHA, we can see beautiful uh, uh, signal appearing at the cell, cell membrane. And if we merge the signal, uh, we see uh, um, visualization of, of the receptor at the, the cell membrane. However, when we look at uh, the mutant form, um, we don't see any signal um, when we look at intact cells. And of course, using the, the negative uh, control of the MP factor, we don't see anything as well. So this indicated to us that the monocornin 4 receptor, or at least the mutated version, doesn't get expressed at the membrane, um, which is what we hypothesized. So what we also did is we did the same trick. So we had the HA tagged uh, wild type construct and the mutant construct and the anti factor. But now we uh, permeabilized cells. Um, so this allowed us to look inside the cell. And as you can see here, we see a, a monocornin 4 signal inside the cell uh, with the wild type construct. But we also see the same uh, 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 amount of signal in, with our, our mutated construct. So this suggested to us that, that the melancholin 4 mutant uh, receptor does get expressed. However, it doesn't get uh, transported to the membrane um, and it doesn't get uh, incorporated into the membrane uh, correctly. So this suggested that it was indeed a loss of function in vitro. So we followed this up um, using a couple of uh, uh, assays. 
So the first thing we did is a, uh, we used a Lexi um, reporter essay, um, which is shown here in panel D. Um, so again, we used uh, the Manicorn and Ford Wildcard construct, we used uh, the mutated form construct, and we used an empty factor. And we co expressed these uh, constructs with uh, a Cree Lexi um, construct. So this is a uh, cyclic AMP re responsive element, which is fused to Lexi. So if we add alpha MSH to um, the cells, um, Manicorn 4 gets activated because alpha MSH is the agonist. And um, we can visualize a signal using this, uh, this construct. Um, and as you can see here, if we add alpha MSH um, to the cells in increasing amounts, we see a beautiful dose response curve in the wild type construct. Um, however, we don't see any uh, uh, signal um, with the mutated uh, form. Again, suggesting that, that there is no uh, uh, function of this mutant uh, receptor. We did the same um, assay, however, now we, uh, we uh, um, stimulated the cells with forskolin, which is an intrinsic activator of cyclic AMP. And this is uh, to control for the amount of cells that we, uh, we transfected with the constructs. And as you can see here, um, all three cell lines, um, uh, well, all three constructs, the wild type, um, the empty factor, uh, but also the, um, uh, the mutated form, uh, had a similar um, um, signal. So we, we definitely uh, um, uh, transfected an equal amount of cells. Finally, um, we did a uh, receptor binding competition assay. So here you can see uh, we have cold competing uh, MEP alpha MSH. And then we have radio, uh, radioactive labeled um, uh, alpha MSH. And if we increase the amount of cold competing alpha MSH, the amount of binding uh, of the radioactive labeled alpha MSH to the receptor should go down. And as you can see, there is indeed a, a, a competition uh, curve. However, this is a completely as absence for the mutated form. So this, um, um, all this in vitro data together um, suggested and showed to us that, that the mutated form of the receptor um, results in lots of function in vitro. Um, the next question, of course, was what happens in, in vivo? So what we... Uh, what we did is we, we bred a cohort of um, uh, wild type rats. We had heterozygous mutant rats and we had homozygous mutant rats. And we followed their body weight um, and we started at postnatal day 33 and we followed them till about three months of age. And as you can clearly see here, there was an increased body weight phenotype in the homozygous uh, mutant rats and the heterozygous mutant rats showed a uh, uh, um, intermediate phenotype. The same data is shown here on the right. However, now it's shown as a relatively body weight as percentage. So the, the body weight of the, the wild type rats is set at 100%. And you can see that the, the heterozygous rats show a, a late onset uh, obesity phenotype, whereas the homozygous uh, mutant rats show a early onset uh, obesity phenotype. And this fits with, with what has been seen in the mouse models. So we wanted to know if this, uh, this, this change in, in the body weight phenotype was uh, linked to, to an increased length, body weight, uh, sorry, body length. And indeed, both the heterozygous and the homozygous mutant rats uh, had increased body weight compared to uh, wild type rats. And they also had increased uh, waist circumference um, compared to wild type rats. So there's a clear body weight phenotype. And the next question that we asked ourselves was, is this due to a increase in, uh, in fatness? So about 100 days uh, after birth, uh, we sacked the rats. Um, all these studies that I, that I show you now are on a low-fat diet. It's a 12% uh, um, um, standard chow diet, 3.1 kcals per gram. And when we sacked the rats about, about a little bit more than three months after uh, uh, birth, we could see uh, that if we measured subcutaneous white adipose tissue or perirenal uh, white adipose tissue, that um, the amount of, of white adipose tissue, in this case subcutaneous, was about fourfold, fivefold increased in uh, homozygous mutant rats, uh, rats compared to the wild types. And even if we normalized it for body weight, there still was a strong increase. And we see the same um, increase in, in, in white adipose tissue for the perirenal uh, fat tags. 
And again, if we normalize it for body weight, um, it was still strongly increased. So there's an increase in, in, in uh, fat pad uh, size. We also wanted to know if the adipocyte um, um, cell size was increased. So we analyzed perirenal white adipose tissue adipocyte um, cell surface. And we showed that um, they were indeed larger. And here to the right, you can see uh, uh, an example of the, 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 the cell size. So another thing that we wanted to know is what about hormone levels? So we, um, um, we analyzed leptin and insulin. Um, and as you can see here, there's a, uh, a strong increase in leptin levels, about um, seven, eight-fold increase in leptin levels. And there's about a, a four-fold increase in uh, insulin um, hormone levels in, in the knockout or in the, the homozygous mutant rats compared to the wild types. So there's a clear phenotype on, uh, on body weight. Um, what we wanted to know now is um, do these rats also show an increased uh, feeding uh, phenotype? So during postnatal week eight, um, we had a cohort of wild type heterozygous and homozygous mutant rats. And this is the average body weight during that week eight. So you can see here, there's no difference between the heterozygous and the uh, wild type rats at this time point. However, the, the homozygous mutant rats were uh, um, uh, much heavier compared to wild types and heterozygous rats. The cumulative food intake um, was slightly higher in heterozygous rats, but not significantly higher. Um, however, the homozygous mutant rats were, were uh, strongly hyperphagic. And even if we um, uh, normalized the food intake for uh, body weight, we could see a uh, hyperphagia in, in both the heterozygous and the homozygous mutant rats. Um, so this indicated that um, at this time point, uh, postnatal week eight, um, at least the, the um, homozygous mutant threats are clearly hyperphagic. We also looked at the fecal output, which was again uh, strongly increased in the homozygous mutant threats. And we also looked at fecal energy loss in their stool, uh, which is also increased. And we calculated the feed conversion efficiency, which is the, the difference in gram body weight divided by the um, effective uh, energy intake. And this did not differ between any of the three groups um, during this time period. So um, there was a clear, there's a clear phenotype on, on, on feeding. Um, another question that we asked ourselves is, um, is there a difference in locomotor activity? So we had a cohort of wild type and, uh, and uh, homozygous rats. And we used a home, code, a home cage monitoring uh, um, system. Um, and we monitored their, their locomotor activity. So shown here in panel A, you can see the distance traveled um, for the total of 24 hours, but also for the, the dark phase or for the light phase. And um, the homozygous mutant rats were um, uh, moving less compared to the wild types, um, both in the light phase and in the dark phase. And the same data, the same 24-hour data, is shown here in um, graph B. Um, here, the dark phase is indicated by a bar. And you can see clearly see that they're, they're moving less, both during the light phase and during the dark phase. Um, so we have a uh, body weight phenotype, a, a fat mass phenotype, feeding and uh, locomotor activity. Um, and they all parallel with the, the phenotypes that have been reported for the, the mouse models. Um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a, a, an in vivo confirmation of, uh, of our loss of function. So what we did is we took um, wild type rats and knockout um, and rats, homozygous mutant rats, and um, we gave them an ICV uh, third ventricle cannula, and we injected either saline MT2, which is the, the non-selective MC34R uh, agonist, and ADRP, which is the, the non-selective uh, antagonist or inverse agonist. And MT2 should decrease food intake in wild type rats, and ADRP should increase food intake. Um, so we measured food intake uh, 22 hours following the injection. And as you can see here, the MT2 injected wild type mice, or treated wild type mice, decreased their food intake compared to uh, saline uh, injected uh, wild type rats. And if we um, treated them with AGRP, 
it increased for intake compared to the, the saline multipreps. So that fits. Um, if we treated uh, melancholy before uh, functional knockout rats with saline, uh, you can see that compared to uh, wild type saline uh, rats, they are hyperphagic. However, um, injecting them with either MT2 or AERP did not have a, uh, a significant effect on food intake. So this confirmed to us that we, we have a loss of function in, in vivo. And um, we look at the delta body weight depicted here in panel B, and you can see that MT2 decreased body weight, uh, whereas AGRP increased body weight in, in wild type rats. However, in the homozygous mutant rats, uh, there was no, uh, no clear difference. So another thing that we wanted to check, which we can do in rats, is um, menocordins, especially menocordin 4, has been suggested to play a role in grooming behavior in rats. Um, so we use this red model to, uh, to, to elicit MT2 induced grooming. So uh, again, MT2 was in, in, uh, injected uh, in the third ventricle and we uh, monitored the amount of grooming events. And as you can see here, the um, MT2 induced grooming, uh, or the number of events in, in wild type mice, uh, sorry, rats, was much higher uh, or this, this effect was completely absent in homozygous mutant rats. Um, and this told us that um, MT2 induced grooming um, is, act or is, is activated um, via the melancholin receptor 4, which is something that, that was still a question in the literature. Um, another thing that we looked at is um, melancholin 4 or modulation of melancholin 4 function um, results in a, or loss of melancholin 4 results in an increased preference for, a, for, for fat. For, for fat feeding. Um, so what we did, we, uh, we took a cohort of uh, wild type rats and homozygous mutant rats. They were uh, on chow for 10 days. And after this measurement, we switched them to a high fat diet. Um, they were allowed to feed for a week. And then after a week, we, uh, um, we measured their, their body weight. Um, and as you can see here, either the 10 days that we measured on the chow diet or um, 10 days that we measured on the high fat, high sucrose diet. So this is a, I have to clarify that this is a, this is a choice diet. Um, the rats um, had two dispensers in their, uh, in their home cage. One was filled with the, the, the chow diet, which is the 12% low fat diet. And the other uh, dispenser was filled with a 45% high fat diet. The rats also has access to, uh, to a, a bottle with normal water. And they also had access to a bottle with 30% sucrose water. Um, to measure their uh, carbohydrate uh, uh, preference. So what you can see here is that even if we put them on a high fat, high sucrose diet, um, the, the homozygous mutant rats increase their body weight um, uh, more strongly compared to the wild type rats. However, this is, is less obvious than what you can example see in Manicorna 4 mouse models. Um, for example, when you put a melancholin 4 mouse um, uh, on a non-choice high-fat diet, yeah, its body weight just shoots up like, like a rocket. Um, the difference could be that that data was generated not using a choice diet, whereas this data using the red model is a choice model. Um, so that might be a difference. So we look at the cumulative food intake during the chow week, uh, or the 10 days measured on chow, and um, the homozygous mutant rats are uh, uh, hyperphagic. And if we um, look at uh, uh, the total cumulative intake during the, the high fat, high sucrose choice uh, feeding, the homozygous mutant rats are still uh, um, hyperphagic. However, this is not um, significantly different. Most interesting is that we, uh, we calculated the data as percentage um, preference. So we looked at chow, high fat diet, and the, the, the high sucrose water, um, which indicating for, for fat and, and carbohydrates. And we didn't see any difference between uh, the wild type and the homozygous mutant rats um, looking at the, the low fat diet. However, the, the homozygous mutant rats had a, had a, a strong preference uh, for the high fat diet. And they had a decreased preference for uh, uh, the carbohydrates. And again, this, this fits with, uh, which has been published in the literature um, using either the mouse models or um, uh, pharmacological uh, uh, 
modulation of the uh, quantum forward function. So finally, um, we did a uh, small uh, um, analysis of uh, uh, gene expression in the hypothalamus. So we took the whole hypothalamus and um, we looked at the POMC, CARP-P, MPY, and monocorneal receptor 3. And you can see that um, in uh, homozygous mutant rats, expression of uh, POMC, um, CARP-P, and monocorneal receptor 3 was increased. However, uh, we didn't see any difference in, in MPY expression. Um, so all this data has been published last year uh, um, in um, obesity. And um, feel free to, to uh, look in that paper for any more uh, details. Uh, um, so just to summarize um, the similarities so far between the mouse and the rat uh, loss of function models. Um, seem to be that they're both hyperphagic. They both increase their uh, their body weight. Um, they both increase their body length. They have increased leptin and insulin levels, um, increased white adipose tissue levels, uh, decreased ambulatory activity, and uh, an increased uh, high fat substrate preference. So, what seem to be any uh, differences so far between uh, the mouse and the rat models? Um, we observed. Uh, increased POMC expression, um, but this was using whole hypothalamic uh, or whole hypothalamus, uh, hypothalamus um, in the red model. In the mouse model, the monoclonal 4 normal mice, it has been reported that there's increased MPY expression in the DMH. Um, we didn't see any difference in MPY expression, but again, we used the whole hypothalamus. Um, so these, uh, these differences might be. Um, might not be there if we can do a more detailed analysis um, using uh, different uh, brain regions or specific brain nuclei in the red model. And um, there also seems to be a different response to, to a, a high fat or, or a high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, but we have, to, uh, um, we have to remember that the rats were put on a choice diet, whereas the uh, mice were not put on a choice diet. So um, this could explain why rats do not increase their, their body weight that strongly, whereas melancholic four uh, mice do. And um, so one thing that we showed so far using this red model um, that hadn't been shown before um, was that MT2 induced grooming is activated uh, solely via MC4R uh, mediated pathway. So um, when I moved here to, uh, to Cincinnati, um, and my lab here is, is, is focused or specialized in bioreactive surgery. So um, one thing that we wanted to, to, to look at is we wanted to use this model, and it, um, so far it seems that the, the melanocorn 4 mutant red is a bona fide model to study melanocorn 4 function. And we wanted to look at um, how melanocorn 4 interacts with uh, bioreactive surgery. Um, so we came up with the hypothesis that um, Melanocorn 4 mediated signaling is necessary to induce the metabolic improvements after vertical sleeve gastrectomy, um, which we call VSG in short. So, vertical sleeve gastrectomy is a bioreactic procedure um, where we dissect um, 80 to 90 percent of the stomach, um, and, and that's it uh, basically. Um, it has been shown in humans that uh, dieting is often uh, insufficient to uh, reduce body weight. However, um, so far, bioreactic surgery, um, which includes VSG, um, has, is, is successful in uh, inducing sustained body weight loss um, following surgery in humans. And of course, what we had in mind is we wanted to know whether um, all those human subjects that have a, a mutation um, or are haplo insufficient for melanocorn 4, if they could have. Um, um, vertical sleeve cassectomy surgery to, uh, to, to induce sustained body weight loss. So what you see here is a, uh, a cohort that we, we uh, had here in Cincinnati. Um, in black uh, is shown the wild type um, rats, um, heterozygous mutant rats are shown in red, and homozygous mutant rats are shown in blue. Um, again, we followed their body weight starting uh, about 25 uh, postnatal days, um, postnatal days uh, 25, 
and we followed them until day 80. And as you can see here, uh, at postnatal day 55, um, all, all animals were switched to a high fat diet. So that, that's a 40% um, high fat diet. Um, you can see two bars in yellow. Uh, that's where I measured food intake. Um, so I did one measurement on chow, and I did one measurement on high fat diet, which I'll show two slides down. Um, so again, we see a clear uh, body weight phenotype um, where the homozygous rats are, are uh, much heavier compared to the wild types. And again, the heterozygous rats show a uh, intermediate phenotype. Um, we see an early onset uh, obesity phenotype in the homozygous mutant rats, whereas the heterozygous mutant rats show a, a late onset uh, uh, phenotype. So we measured food intake. Uh, um, during uh, the both time frames indicated in yellow here. And the left one is on Chow. Um, so we see a, uh, uh, an increase in food intake in, in homozygous mutant rats uh, compared to wild type uh, siblings. Um, whereas the heterozygous mutant rats now also show an, uh, an increased food intake compared to wild types. And the heterozygous mutant rats show a, a intermediate phenotype. Um, after the rats were switched to uh, um, the high fat diet, um, we basically see the same uh, uh, phenotype. Um, although the, the hyperphagic um, uh, phenotype seemed to be even stronger on the high fat diet, again, the homozygous mutant rats are strongly hyperphagic, whereas the heterozygous uh, mutant rats show an intermediate phenotype. Um, we also calculate feed efficiency. Um, we had to change in body weight and we only knew what the rats were eating in this instance. And um, you can see here that uh, on the chow uh, diet, both the, the heterozygous and the homozygous mutant rats seem to have an increased feed efficiency. Um, whereas on the high fat diet, um, they still both have an increased feed efficiency compared to wild type rats. However, homozygous mutant rats also seem to be more efficient compared to heterozygous uh, mutant uh, rats. So after um, they were uh, on a high fat diet for, for, for uh, about four weeks, um, we uh, performed VSG surgery. And what you see here in this graph is the, the body weight following um, the surgery. Um, we have six different groups. So wild type, heterozygous, homozygous, sham groups. So these animals uh, receive a sham surgery um, to control for the surgical uh, procedure. And um, the open boxes um, show the, the, the rats that received VSG surgery. And um, all rats were maintained on a high fat diet following uh, surgery. And what you can see here is that um, in wild types, the surgery, the sham surgery has a little effect on the, on the rats, but then they, they increase their body weight. And I followed the rats almost uh, 75 days uh, after surgery. What we see is that there is a, 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 a more strong loss of, of body weight following VSG surgery in wild type rats. And um, this body weight difference is sustained um, uh, all throughout the, the experimental timeline. In heterozygous uh, mutant rats, we see the same thing. We see an intermediate phenotype compared to wild type sham rats and home sham rats. And uh, heterozygous VSG rats. Um, also lose uh, body weight um, compared to their sham treated uh, animals controls. And this body weight loss is sustained as well. And also in homozygous uh, mutant rats, um, we see a stronger loss of body weight in the VSG treated animals. And again, this, this body weight loss is sustained um, during the experimental timeline. And shown here is the, uh, we put the, the body weight of every animal, we set it at 100%. So you can see um, that both in wild type animals and in heterozygous animals, but also in homozygous animals, um, VSG um, was perfectly able in, in uh, decreasing uh, body weight and, and resulting in sustained body weight loss. Um, so the question we had is this, this difference in, uh, in body weight is that, uh, maybe due to a, a difference in lean mass. Um, so using NMR, um, 
we looked at the pre-surgery EMS. Um, and what we can see here is that um, there's no difference between the wild-type Shan and wild-type PSG cohorts or heterozygous or for the homozygous mutant rats. However, we see a gene, gene dose-dependent increase in DMAS, whereas the heterozygous uh, mutant rats show an intermediate phenotype compared to homozygous mutant rats and wild-type rats. And this fits with um, the data that has been published uh, regarding the mouse model that melanocortin 4 deficiency increases lean mass. If we look um, at the post-operative day 43 or, or 73, um, we don't see any effect of CSG on lean mass. However, uh, we still see a gene dose dependent increase in lean mass um, due to the melanocortin 4 deficiency. So the difference in body weight didn't seem to be caused by a difference in lean mass. Um, so the next step and the next logical step to look at was fat mass. So again, we looked at the fat mass uh, using NMR pre-surgical and post-operative day 43 and post-operative day 73. And um, what you can clearly see here is that there is an increase in fat mass, both in the heterozygous mutant rats as well as in the homozygous mutant rats. And again, heterozygous mutant rats show an intermediate phenotype um, and it's quite, it's quite, just to note out, these, these guys have about 200 grams of fat mass there. They're, they're pretty big. <laughs> um, we can see um, that VSG decreases fat mass in wild types, in heterozygous mutant rats, but also in homozygous mutant rats. Um, this has been reported before by our group. Um, and this effect is sustained. Um, it's also uh, um, observed at post of birthday day uh, um, 73. So um, there's a big effect on adiposity and um, due to the surgery, of course, we also wanted to know if um, what well, we have reported before that, that, that Pyrex surgery or VSG improves uh, glucose metabolism. So we wanted to know if um, melanocortin 4 deficient rats have um, impaired glucose tolerance and whether VSG surgery could improve this um, uh, glucose intolerance. So what you see here on the left is the fasting glucose uh, um, values. Um, rats were, were uh, uh, fasted in the early morning for five hours and uh, the IP, uh, so we did an intraperitoneal IP GTT. Um, it was performed in the early afternoon. Um, we see a uh, slightly elevated uh, blood glucose values in the home sham rats. However, this was not statistically different. Um, this might be due uh, to the, the big amount of groups we used. Um, we did see a uh, reduction in uh, blood glucose values in the home VSG uh, rats compared to the home sham rats. So in panel B, um, we showed uh, the blood glucose values um, following uh, um, IP administration of 1.25 grams per kilogram um, glucose. Um, shown in black again are the, the wild type sham rats. Um, in red are the, the heterozygous mutant rats uh, sham. And in blue are the homozygous mutant sham rats. Um, so what is uh, clearly visible is that homozygous mutant rats have impaired glucose tolerance um, at this time point and being on these diets. And um, we didn't really see an impaired glucose tolerance for the um, heterozygous uh, mutant sham rats. Um, could be that this, uh, this difference might become more pronounced if you keep them on a high-fat diet longer. Or, um, if we look at the effect of surgery, we see an improvement in wild-type VSG rats compared to their wild-type sham counterparts. The same is true for the heterozygous mutant rats compared to their heterozygous sham rats. And the same is also true for um, the homozygous mutant rats, where we also see an improvement. This is more easily visualized uh, here in panel C, um, where we show area under the curve. Uh, so we show an improvement in um, um, all three genotypes um, and due to the VSG surgery. And um, doing an analysis, a statistical analysis, we observed that, that um, homozygous mutant rats had impaired glucose tolerance um, compared to wild-type and heterozygous mutant rats. 
Um, so there's, a, there's an effect of melanin corner for deficiency and of the VSG surgery on the glucose metabolism. Of course, we also wanted to look at the insulin levels. So here in panel D, you can see uh, um, the fasting plasma uh, insulin levels. Um, the, the, in black again is the wild type animals, heterozygous animals in red, and the um, hom homozygous mutant rats in blue. Um, you, we see again that there's a strong increase in, in, in plasma insulin levels, as we had shown before. And uh, also the, the heterozygous uh, mutant rats at this time point showed an increase in, uh, in insulin levels. If we look at the plasma insulin levels during the IPGTT, um, we see that uh, basically all groups are capable of increasing um, their insulin levels. Um, however, the, the homozygous uh, um, sham rats just have strongly elevated insulin levels. And again, we see uh, improvements for example, here in the, the homozygous uh, mutant rats, improvements of uh, VSG surgery on the insulin levels. And finally, uh, if you look in panel F, we also looked at the uh, um, HbA1c, um, which is an indicator, a long-term indicator of uh, uh, glucose handling. And we saw that um, the VSG surgery had uh, improved HbA1c uh, uh, levels uh, following the surgery. Um, so, we also wanted to look at um, uh, macronutrient preference again. Um, we know that melancholin-4 deficiency increases the preference for fat while decreasing preference for carbohydrates. Um, and we have previously reported that um, VSG surgery does the opposite. So, it decreases preference for fat and it increases the preference for carbohydrate. So, the rats were offered um, three different dispens dispensers, either with uh, fat, uh, carbohydrates, or protein. And shown here in panel A, um, we see the total intake in cake house uh, for all six groups. And um, though the difference, um, so the homozygous sham animals um, had increased, um, they were hyperphagic compared to the, the wild type sham cohort. Um, if we look at the, the percentage of um, the different macronutrients that they were eating, um, we didn't observe a increase in, in fat preference in the home sham animals. But um, we believe that due to the, the, the high amount of experimental groups we had to run at the same time, uh, only limiting the number of animals we could run per, per group, so this is N is six or seven per, per group. Um, and this, using this paradigm, it's, it's a little bit noisier because the rats uh, are, tend to kick over their, their, their food hoppers and their uh, um, um, glass jars. Um, so my personal opinion is that the um, home sham animals still have a preference for fat. However, it didn't, um, um, it wasn't visualized um, statistically, or it wasn't statistically different in this paradigm um, due to the paradigm uh, used. However, um, if we look at the VSG cohorts, there is a, uh, a decrease in fat preference, and there is an increase in carbohydrate preference, um, whereas there is no change in protein preference. Um, so this, this fits with the, the data we've published before regarding uh, um, um, the effect of VSG surgery on macronutrient preference. And um, we also show that these differences are, not, uh, are independent of uh, melancholin-4 function. Um, all the data that I just showed you about the VSG surgery um, should appear on the internet pretty soon. Um, it got published in AGP Endocrinology Metabolism. So um, all, all details will, uh, if you read the, the, the manuscript, uh, of course, uh, in more detail, um, it will explain how we did everything. So just to summarize this, um, this, this project, um, the, the, the mutation increased body weight and resulted again in hyperphagia. We uh, observed increased lean mass and increased fat mass. The effect of, uh, of VSG surgery um, were, uh, or the effect of VSG surgery on body weight were independent of melancholin-4 function. Um, we showed that melancholin-4 deficiency resulted in glucose intolerance. 
Um, and also that the effect of VSG on glucose metabolism were independent of melancholin four function. And finally, um, we also show that the effect of VSG on macronutrient preference um, are independent of melancholin four function. So I think this is a, a good example uh, of, a, of a simple, straightforward study um, using the fat rat and showing its value um, in, the, in, in the scientific community. Um, and it also suggests that, that, that the fat rat is, is ideally suited to do uh, mechanistic studies like, like surgery. Um, I think it will be very interesting to use this red model to do motivational um, studies, either you looking at feeding or drugs. And of course, uh, different behavioral uh, um, paradigms. And I'll leave it at that, um, just to mention the people that were involved. Um, the initial basal characterization uh, um, we did at the Ubach Institute and together with the UMC Utrecht and the Center of Europe AMC. And uh, the second study that I showed you was done here at the University of Cincinnati um, using or um, in the CD lab and the Stephen Woods lab. And I'll be happy to, to answer any of your uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mo. If people have questions, then just enter them in the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them for you. Uh, I do have a question to kick things off. Um, how heavy do these rats become? Uh, <laughs> they can become pretty heavy. Um, but the study we did in the, in the Netherlands, uh, they were on a low-fat diet, um, and we only followed them for uh, for about three months. Um, however, here in, in, in Cincinnati, we, we put them on a the high-fat diet, um, and we did the surgery, and we, we still have this cohort around. And um, so now it's about, I think it's about 100 or 120 days, maybe even more, following the surgery. So the homozygous... Uh, mutant rats uh, that had sham surgery, I think a couple of them uh, have, have had the, the one kilogram uh, level. Um, so the <laughs> they, they, they become pretty, pretty heavy and um, at some point it's, it's very hard to do NMR <laughs> because they become so huge. So because they do become so large, does that limit their lifespan? How old do they generally live? Um, um, that's a good question. We we haven't done any study like that. Um, it has been shown in mice that that uh, melancholin four deficiency does affect the, the lifespan. Um, it would be it would be very interesting to see in rats um, in, in these homozygous mutant or heterozygous mutant rats how old they become. However, it would be a, an expensive study. Uh, I don't think many um, PIs will be happy to to have a cohort around for a long, long time. <laughs> Um, but that, yeah, in short, we, we don't know for the rats, but it, it, if they, um, they seem to mimic or their phenotype seems to overlap pretty strongly with the mouse. So they, uh, they, my guess is they would live less long than, than wild type uh, rats. Great. We have a question from one of the attendees. They would like to know what were the sources of the macronutrients and were there other foods available during the preference test? Um, so the, um, the, we did two different preference studies, so I'll, I'll mention both. Um, the one we did in the Netherlands, um, they just basically had two food dispensers. One was a uh, um, low-fat diet, um, which we call a uh, semi-high-protein diet. The, the, the detail of that diet is, um, is in the obesity paper. Um, the other diet that we used was a 45% uh, high-fat diet. Um, and then they also had a water bottle and a sucrose, 30% sucrose water. The study that we did here, so that, that was what they had. Um, and we switched the food dispensers every two days, so there wouldn't be a side preference. Um, the study here in Cincinnati, um, they get a small dispenser with um, fat. Um, so that's a pure fat. Taste. And then we have two powder diets, which is pure protein and pure um, carbohydrates. Um, the, um, the details of those 
three diets um, has been published recently by one of my colleagues. Um, her name is Wilson Perez, and she published a, uh, a paper on the effects of VSG and macronutrient preference. So if you uh, look her up in PubMed, you'll get the details. Um, probably in a couple of days, the, um, uh, our paper regarding menocortin-4 deficiency and VSG will also appear on PubMed. And all the details regarding these diets uh, are in these two uh, um, manuscripts. I hope that answers the question. Are there any other questions from our attendees? Okay, then I think that wraps it up for today. I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and this webinar will be available on the Taconic website for any colleagues that you may have that were unable to attend or uh, if you would like to go back and reference any of the information. Thank you. Thank you.